This week on Wealth Track, a television exclusive with financial thought leader Paul McCulley. Newly retired from bond giant PIMCO, this masterful investor and legendary Fed watcher warns of financial storms ahead and why cash could be the best refuge. Next on Consuelo Mac, Wealth Track. The company you keep is also the company we keep. Together we help provide a lifetime of guaranteed income and investment solutions. Additional funding provided by Luma Sales, investors seeking exceptional opportunities globally. Research affiliates, an efficient index for an inefficient market. Wintergreen, your home for global value. Rosalind P. Walter and the Dreamin Foundation. Hello and welcome to this edition of Wealth Track. I'm Consuelo Mack. Talk to just about any money manager these days, and the biggest risk they see on the horizon is the level of U.S. debt. By one estimate cited in the Wall Street Journal by columnist and past Wealth Track guest Jason Zweig, the entire U.S. debt load, including all government, corporate and household debt is an estimated $70 trillion. Compare that to the mere $2.7 trillion the U.S. has in currency and bank reserves. As Wag points out, by this measure, the U.S. has levered 26 to 1, not far behind Lehman Brothers' pre-implosion 31 to 1 leverage. To focus on just the current federal government side of things, we consulted some recent analysis by independent research firm Bianco Research. Federal government spending, which hit a record $3.64 billion in the 12 months ended in March, is 25% of GDP. That is the fourth highest level ever. The three loftiest were the war years of 1943, 44, and 45. Meanwhile, tax revenues as a percentage of GDP slumped to 14.5%, a 50-year low last year. Bianco estimates they will bounce back to a still modest 16.4% of GDP this year. What could change this dynamic, raise the tax revenues, and thus reduce the deficit? According to Bianco, the stock market could be the key. As their chart illustrates, a major reason for the $463 billion decline in tax receipts between 2007 and 2010 was a nearly $400 billion plunge in capital gains taxes in 2007 and 2008 alone. Bianco's thesis, which seems to be in accord with Fed Chairman Ben Bernanke's strategy of boosting stock prices, a higher stock market could go a long way to solving the budget problem. Well, we have a real treat for you this week, an interview with noted Fed watcher, great investor and financial thought leader Paul McCulley. It is his first TV appearance since retiring from bond giant PIMCO at the end of last year. Paul has been a wealth track regular since our beginning nearly six years ago and was a familiar face on the financial media circuit along with PIMCO's two other most famous luminaries, Bill Gross and Mohammed El Arian. Paul was a senior partner at PIMCO, a leading member of its investment policy committee, author of the widely followed monthly Global Central Bank Focus, and manager of its huge short-term trading desk, with his hands in an estimated $400 billion plus of assets. As Morningstar wrote in its tribute, the long-term legacy of a short-term PIMCO bond manager, unlike many of his peers, McCulley resisted the temptation to chase, yield, and grow assets, and avoided the twin dangers of subprime mortgages and asset-backed commercial paper, saving his firm and clients from losses and litigation. I asked Paul how he did it. I think the key reason is I'm a long-term student of the work of Hyman Minsky, who has become much more widely known now than he was 20 years ago when I first became a student. And uh, thanks to you, I might add. We'll talk about that in a minute. Mm -hmm. Um, And uh, Hyman came up with the financial instability hypothesis, which very simply stated is that stability ultimately breeds instability because it breeds ever more risky debt arrangements. That's the essence of the Minsky thesis. And I could see that in front of me going on. 
because we had what was known as the great moderation in the yes. economy. Under Alan Greenspan as the Fed exactly. chairman. Exactly. And you had this concept that, yes, we still have recessions, but they're mild little affairs. And that given the fact that we have a much more stable economy, then a prudent person can put on more and more debt. And then you saw that in underwriting standards with respect to mortgages. I mean, when I was a young man, it was 20%, then it became 15, and it became 10, and then it became, if you were remotely rumored to be breathing, you could get a mortgage. Uh, <laughs> so I could witness, living in Orange County was helpful as well, uh, the excesses. Uh, so I decided as a fiduciary and as a member of the investment committee at PEMCO that we would not participate in the excess. And the excess really was in the short end of the market in the commercial paper market that was issued by various sorts of special investment vehicles, the asset backed commercial paper market. Uh, and you also saw it in the senior tranches of tranched out subprime and so forth. And a lot of my competitors in the marketplace got beguiled into believing this stuff was AAA. And we just simply said, no. You've been a big uh, supporter of Ben Bernanke. And, and the Fed has not withdrawn any uh, credit. And in fact, it's, the stimulus continues despite the fact that the economy is recovering. They've kept interest rates at zero percent short-term rates. They've been buying every treasury that's issued in sight. Mm -hmm. When is this going to stop? Why do we still need the financial system to have this kind of stimulus? Because the financial system is what's benefiting from this, not Main Street. I certainly don't like the configuration that we have right now. So what don't you like about it? I mean, well, I don't like the notion that monetary policy and fiscal policy is disproportionately benefiting the financial sector. Uh, it was the financial sector through its own recklessness that took us close to the edge of a depression. And now the financial sector has come back big time. You're not kidding. I mean, bank profits are up to where they were, you know, pre-crisis. Right. And whereas Main Street is still suffering from the blown bubble in property prices more than anything else. So you have a situation where you're sitting there uh, at the Federal Reserve is you see reality on Main Street, which is, you know, over 10 million Americans with negative equity in their home, another 15 uh, million Americans that close to negative equity without being able to get a bid on their house. You see unemployment uh, up at 8% plus. You see long-term employment, uh, the highest level in 50 years. You see all these indicators from Main Street that tell you that you should be accommodated because the Fed does have part of its mandate being to try to achieve full employment. Mm -hmm. So when they look at Main Street, it says be incredibly accommodative. Uh, however, Main Street is not particularly sensitive to low interest rates right now because the problem with houses is not the interest rate it is the value of houses relative to the mortgages that were put on them back during the bubble years in, in technical terms it's known as the liquidity trap on main street uh, but the fed does what it has to do given its limited toolkit and the unintended beneficiary is profits on wall street so i don't think the fed's happy about it but there's not a whole lot they can do about it because if they hike interest rates they could take the starch out of their shirt of Wall Street mm -hmm. but then you would have the reality that Main Street is still suffering. Wall Street is just riding the gravy train is the bottom line. Yes they are. So let me ask you about that gravy train because again I, I think you know as, as Americans feel that there is a dual economy happening here which you, which you just described and there's an inherent unfairness about it. And the fact is that a hedge fund can borrow short, at uh, short-term rates at 0%, and then they can invest in you know, risky assets, whatever they want to do. Isn't the Fed encouraging, in fact, uh, you know, this, the Wall Street's uh, you know, proclivities to take big risks again? The Fed is certainly creating that outcome. And I don't think that the Fed is particularly happy that it's creating that outcome. However, the alternative is worse. Because well, if, what's the alternative now with the economy recovering? The alternative would be to hike interest rates, which would uh, be a negative for Wall Street. Uh, it, would, it would take the juice out of the carry trade. Uh, it would take the froth out of the commodity markets. 
It would lead to a correction probably of 10% or more in the equity market. It would give you a sturdier dollar. So the uh, one-way bets, if you will, that Wall Street is enjoying right now would be uh, thrown into a cocked hat if the Fed were to hike interest rates. And in isolation, uh, I think it's reasonable for people to say, well, just go ahead and do it then. The problem is- Or what gradually, was, or, I mean, they're gonna have to do it when QE2 ends, right? I mean, well, what, what happens- They don't have to hike interest rates okay. uh, when QE2 uh, ends. But the thing in terms, suppose they wanted to punish Wall Street, just as a thesis, you know, with the scenario I laid out, what is the collateral damage for Main Street? I mean, if we think that housing prices uh, still have downside risk given the current interest rate structure, what would happen if you took up the mortgage rate by 100 basis points or a full percentage point? Uh, it would be even worse for uh, Main Street. Suppose you took 10% off the equity market, that would feed back into uh, negative consumer sentiment because the only thing the average American can point to with some degree of smile on his face is his 401k has recovered from a 201k back to at least a 301k. Uh, so you'd smack uh, the uh, retirement savings of the household sector. So it would not be a unalloyed blessing to punish Wall Street because the collateral damage would be on Main Street as well. But I understand the argument very, very well. And at some point, guess what? The Fed is going to have to face reality, and at some point they're going to have to raise interest rates from artificially low 0%, I'm sorry, and they're going to you know, ha have yeah, to no, in, in the get into the real economy. I mean, In the fullness of time, they will. Right. Time is simply not full yet. And in particular, the Fed wants to see core inflation away from the headline, which has the food and energy in it, it wants to see core inflation move up. It also wants to see the unemployment rate move down. So as which it's doing? It's moving down uh, from a very high level, but they want to see it move down enough that there is some upward movement in the wage side of things. Mm -hmm. uh, we're a long way from full employment. Labor doesn't have pricing power. Um, because you have so much excess labor in the marketplace. So they want to see those traditional indicators on inflation and unemployment improve sufficiently uh, before they hike interest rates. So when do you think that the Fed is going to start withdrawing the stimulus? And, well, I, and, you know, and, uh, and basically what happens when it does? QE2 will end in June. June. The big issue is when do they start normalizing the Fed funds rate up? Uh, from uh, its current near zero target. I don't think they will do that this year. They may do it in 2012, but I think the Fed will be very, very good at telegraphing when they're going to do it. So I think for investors, the issue is not when they're going to actually hike rates, but when they're going to signal that they're going to hike interest rates, kind of similar to what it was with QE2. Uh, been signaled in August and implemented in November. In between August and November, uh, you had the stock market rally uh, over 10%. So I think sometime in the next six months, the Fed will have sufficient confidence to start signaling that they're thinking in terms of moving the Fed funds right up, at which point I think you probably have a 10% correction in the stock market. So my big message for investors these days, if is that if cash in your money market account or in your bank CD has been driving you nuts because you haven't earned anything right. on it. Punishing savers. Punishing savers. If you say, I won't take it anymore and say, I'm gonna take my money out of my next three months CD when it matures and put it in the stock market, uh, then uh, that is gonna be the equivalent of buying the top on the stock market. So if you've been riding it for two years, dealing with your nothing on your CDs, for God's sake, don't invest your CD money into the stock market on the next uh, maturity rollover. Uh, if you stuck it out this long, for Christ's sake, stick it out a bit longer. Because when the Fed does hike interest rates, theoretically everybody in short-term money will say, finally, banks will increase their CD rates. Mm -hmm. And that's true but also the stock market's gonna have a wicked correction. And so therefore my big counsel to the public, not to Wall Street, is don't 
buy right into the face of the Fed hiking interest rates. Which uh, is going to happen sooner Which is probably going to happen in later. the next six to 12 months. So where do we go? Where, where do we invest right now? I don't think this is a propitious time to make a lot of money in your investment portfolio. And I think in terms of the last couple of years, uh, it's been a great opportunity to make a lot of money in risk assets. Whether right, or not high yield bonds, high yield stocks, bonds, the commodities. Stock market, commodities. And that was a direct function of the fact uh, that the Fed was pursuing a reflationary policy. It hasn't worked particularly well for Main Street. Uh, Main Street hasn't had the quote unquote normal response uh, to easy money. Uh, but Wall Street certainly has had the normal mm -hmm. response spiked. Uh, so it's been a great time for, for investors. Uh, investors to have risk in their portfolio. And you can't go to heaven twice for the same decision. If you made the decision two years ago, God bless you. If you didn't make the decision two years ago and are saying, I'll make it now to get engaged in risk assets, uh, then effectively you're getting in uh, at last call, uh, which is probably going to be a particularly unpleasant experience. So I, I don't think investors should try to squeeze performance out right now because we're on the cusp of something important, which is, as you noted, the Fed will, in the fullness of time, normalize short rates. That will be a fundamental change in the environment. And normalizing short rates means short rates should be where? The Fed funds rate should be where <laughs> if they were not so heavily involved? I think probably something with a two handle on it, if I can put it that way, which I know that. Somewhere yeah, in the two percent range. Two to three percent. Now I know that my Big mom, and, mom and dad will can say, "Son, that's not high enough. We need a little bit more than that." But I think probably two to three percent is where we will be going. Not soon, but it's where we will be going, uh, which will put the short-term rate, broadly speaking, in line with where the inflation rate is, which will mean that real rates are pretty close to zero. And I think that's probably the new normal in a world where the property market. Uh, is on the backside of a bubble. Where do you think the long bond will be? Uh, what's the, what's the, a normal rate for the long bond? Again, if the somewhere between Treasury four were buying and five percent, four and five percent. Oh, so we're oh for the ten year and ten year the, and yeah. the thirty year. It's got a very big spread over the ten year. And for retail investors, I really don't see any particular reason to ever fool around with the thirty year bond. Uh, so I focus in on the 10-year. And actually, my favorite sector, uh, notably for the retail investor, is the municipal bond sector right now. It is trading at its cheapest relative valuation. Uh, to treasuries. To treasuries and decades. And so I, if I have to put money to work in the bond market now uh, in a, with an investment thesis, intermediate grade municipals beat everything else hands down for the taxable investor. Paul, your former firm, PIMCO, predicted a new normal of subpar economic growth and also investment returns. The last two years have been anything but subpar as far as investment returns are concerned. So what's the new normal or what's going to be normal? <laughs> what's, our, what's our investment climate going to be like? Uh, in the next couple of years? The phrase new normal is hard to define in many respects. New normal implies that it's different from where we were in the old normal. And in that standpoint, we are in a new normal on Main Street. And that housing prices going down and staying down and having the housing sector not responsive to zero interest rates is clearly different than any time in our adult lifetime. The housing sector has always been sensitive to interest rates, and it's not. So when we think in terms of Main Street, and I focus particularly on the uh, housing market, clearly we are in a new normal that is very unpleasant. At the same time, we've had a old and ordinary response from government, both on fiscal policy with tax cuts, and expenditure increases, and most importantly, with the Fed being super accommodative. So that's how the Fed and fiscal authority always acted, you know, in our lifetime. 
And but they've really gone to an extreme. The Fed has gone to an extreme in this right. particular. Right. I, mean, I mean, they've right. gone from 12 ounce glasses to 16 ounce glasses. Right. And Wall Street has reacted in a very old normal sort of way. Right. We know how to react to a 12 ounce glass, and now they're serving 16 ounces. Uh, so we have not had a new normal in Wall Street's response to munificent monetary policy. So that's why it's so hard for me to answer the question because it underscores this dichotomy between Main Street and Wall Street. And it's a conundrum in many respects. And with your viewers, it's particularly difficult because they live on Main Street, right. but they invest on Wall Street. So they have a Jekyll and Hyde sort of experience. Is that, you know, yeah, my 401k is up because I was invested in the stock market, so that's kind of cool. Uh, but I looked at the boss today at the office and suggested that he should think about giving me a raise, and he looked at me like I'd shot his dog. I mean, <laughs> try to square these two things here for me. And it truly is a bifurcated world. You wrote a terrific book in 2007 called Your Financial Edge how to take the curves in shifting financial markets and keep your portfolio on track. Uh, you got, gave us some great advice back then. Um, so what's your advice today to individual investors? The big thing I wrote in that book was emerging markets. I was an evangelist in many respects for emerging markets. Stocks. Particularly, particularly, sto yes. particularly stocks and also the currencies of the emerging markets. And clearly both the, the stocks and the currencies had their correction in 2008 in the financial crisis. Uh, but since that book was published, I feel really good about uh, the performance of that recommendation. Uh, and I really was an evangelist about the whole sort of yeah, thing. You were. I would temper my uh, fire and brimstone about that investment idea now because it is done so incredibly well. And you're, you have distinct risk in the emerging markets now of actually overheating. So my first recommendation is if you bought into the uh, uh, evangelism for the emerging markets, then probably it's sense to take, it makes sense to look at your weighting because the market itself has taken your weighting up. That's a high quality problem. Mm -hmm. I plan to put X percent in and now I am two times X. Well, I didn't put any more money in, how come I'm two times X? Well, it's because they asked that that you bought double. <laughs> well, maybe I should let some of it go. So that concept of rebalancing from your winners right. is uh, a first idea. Okay, so where do we put the money? What, what, what are you overweight now in, in, your port in, in John's portfolio, your son's uh, portfolio, a long-term portfolio? I actually like um, big cap uh, stocks right here in the United States. Um, I think they represent value. Big cap stocks tend to have a great deal of global exposure. And not surprising, at least to me, big caps have uh, not done well versus small caps over the last couple of years. And like 10 years, like <laughs> <laughs> a little bit longer than a couple of years. Yeah, a little bit, well, yeah. particularly over the last couple of years. Right. That, the fact of the matter is junk stocks all the ways lead out of a recession on the back of uh, a liquidity infusion uh, from the central bank. And when you get your rotation from the junk, uh, if you will, to the quality within the stock market is when the Fed has reached the point that it can say last call on the munificent liquidity. Final question, one investment for a long-term diversified portfolio that we all should own some of. I guess I would be philosophical in answering your question, Consuelo, is if there's one thing, call it a boat or SUV, or an RV, or whatever the case may be, if there's one thing that you want before you die, or one thing you want to do before you die, go ahead and do it now and don't put it off anymore. I've never seen a hearse with a U-Haul trailer behind it. <laughs> so typical of Paul McCulley. <laughs> Recently retired, uh, you know, just short-term bond 
trader extraordinaire, Fed watcher extraordinaire, but still a financial thought leader and a great investor. Paul, it's great to have you on Wealth Track. Thank you, Consuelo. It is wonderful to have Paul back. Well, next week we'll be talking stocks, bonds, money flows, and market trends with a dynamic duo. One of Smart Money Magazine's world's greatest investors, mid-cap money manager Tira Zerthusen, and financial thought leader James Bianco, whose Bianco research publishes some of the most interesting and original market analysis in the business. Meanwhile, to see this program again, please go to our website, wealthtrack.com, and while you're there, check out WealthTrack Extra, where you can find complete extended interviews with some Wall Street greats, including Paul McCulley. Thank you for taking the time to visit with us. Make the week ahead a profitable and a productive one. Additional funding provided by Luma Sales, investors seeking exceptional opportunities globally. Research affiliates, an efficient index for an inefficient market. Wintergreen, your home for global value. Rosalind P. Walter and the Dreamin Foundation.